I had the pleasure of working under Secretary Kerry and um, the amazing people in, in his office and do a lot of work with the Children's Cabinet. And so um, since I have a personal connection to many of the trauma-informed community networks around the state, um, we just felt it would be um, timely and, and <clears throat> um, a good opportunity to have these discussions and conversations with folks who are doing the very important work on the on the ground and in communities of responding to trauma and preventing and mitigating adverse childhood experiences. So without the first lady being here, I would like to just give the floor to Secretary Kerry. Uh, if you have a few words that you want to say before passing off to Emily to go ahead and get us started. Sure, thank you. And, and Chidi, you've just been a tremendous uh, contributor to this administration, both in your role earlier with the First Lady's Office, but now uh, working as liaison and, and really the governor's advi advisor on trauma-informed care and that whole spectrum of, of how, to, how to address the needs of many, many different populations that, you know, it, it's, again, it's been around for 25 years, the ACEs study, but we're only fully appreciating how to put that operationally into action and to, to make our, our services trauma-informed, evidence-based, and more effective. And, and I'll just report that, again, the first the main reason I'm here is to listen and learn what's working at the local level. What are you seeing in the, in the individuals, families, communities that you're treating? Um, I will say that at the, in my role as the secretary, I'm the, the chair of the State Executive Council on Children's Services. And I will say front and center, within the, our strategic plan that we developed two years ago is making sure that equity is in our policies and procedures at the state and local level and that trauma-informed uh, methods, uh, orientation, uh, operations is there as well. And I think that's not a small, a small thing. I, I'm involved in lots of councils and some of the most effective children's cabinet is definitely an example, incredible forum to bring together and to get sponsorship from the governor and the, and the first lady. Uh, but the SEC, that brings community providers, education, juvenile justice, um, Medicaid, uh, local service providers, schools, um, those that are involved in the foster care system, et cetera, together to really hold each other accountable to make sure that we're providing evidence-based uh, practice. So anyway, just uh, I, this has been one of the great learning opportunities for me over the last three and a half years to really understand better, especially in children's services, but across the spectrum of services, what, what the impact of trauma is both on psychological health, but, but medical health uh, and community health. So looking forward to hearing um, what you all, that what's working, what support from the state is working, how it can be better, and really what we need to do, uh, do better as state policymakers. Um, one other comment I, I'd like to uh, say is, I just want to thank you all, um, because you have been leaders in your communities, leaders providing important services to children's, children and to families. And one thing I've noted in my own work, uh, two things. First is that leading in profound and prolonged uncertainty is exhausting. So many are looking to you, so many are looking to, to me and my work with the governor uh, to provide support, and sometimes there is true chaos. You know, there's there's simple situations, there's complicated situations that are variations of multiple simple situations that you can figure out. Then there's complexity with interaction, and then there's true chaos. And at times in this pandemic, it has been truly chaotic. And the only thing le we as leaders could do is to is to persevere, to provide support, to to be humble servants. And to acknowledge that the most vulnerable, as well as those that are uh, of have great privilege, have been greatly affected. And I just wanted to acknowledge the great work that you as leaders and influencers in your communities, what it has meant to have you staying out there on the front lines, supporting your caregivers, supporting your communities, and how important uh, that has been. And I, in my own role, have had to ask for help. And that I was burned out briefing the governor every morning for 16 weeks straight. Uh, I, I, I had to hold my hand up and say, I need a break. I need to disconnect. 
I need to find physical and, 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 and mental relief here. And uh, I have learned that, I mean, one of the things I've learned even better through this experience is that one of the most powerful, powerful leadership behaviors is for the leader to say that she or he, that they need help themselves and they need, to, they need others to support them and how transformative that leading through vulnerability and, and empathy uh, and, and to be truly real uh, with the teams that we lead, how important that is. So I just wanted to share that and thank you all for all you do and really turn it, this is really a listening opportunity for us. So thanks so much for this opportunity and, and uh, really looking forward to uh, hearing about your experiences. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. What a, a fantastic example of leadership there. And I think inspires all of us to continue to do this work. Um, I wanna get turn over the, the conversation to our folks here from Northern Virginia, but set the stage with a few definitions and frameworks so that everyone um, later can, uh, can gather this information and so we don't have to go into more detail and can get straight to the examples of what you are doing in Northern Virginia. For those of you who ha haven't met, I'm Emily Griffey. I'm the Chief Policy Officer of Voices for Virginia's Children. We're the statewide um, children's advocacy organization based in Richmond, but we are friends and fans of all of the trauma-informed community networks across the state. Um, so really glad to be here today with the Northern Virginia folks. Also super appreciative of the folks in the Governor's Children's Cabinet led by the First Lady and um, where Secretary Kerry is a member and she needs an advisor on trauma-informed care to adopt uh, trauma-informed care as one of their priorities during the Northam administration. So today we're gonna talk about how the pandemic has impacted work with uh, trauma-informed community networks and some examples of what you all have been able to do to respond. Oh, I think we just have the first lady joining us as well. So thank you, Mrs. Northam, hello. Hey guys, how are you? It's great to see everyone. I'm so sorry to be late, but you know, I was stuck in a classroom full of sixth graders. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. We were just going to get started of, of um, meeting our representatives here from the Northern Virginia Trauma Informed Community Networks. We heard a little bit from Secretary Kerry already on his, um, his work from the governor's office and the role of the children's cabinet. And you as the chair of the children's cabinet know a lot about this information in terms of trauma-informed networks. So the folks from Northern Virginia today are gonna to give you a few more examples of, of what their work has been like during the pandemic. Um, feel free to pop in at any time. We have six networks here today that are covering a large part of the state. So a lot of people <laughs> to get through. We'll try to go as quickly as possible. For anyone who's listening to the recording, when we're talking about childhood trauma, you also may have heard it called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs or toxic stress. These are the things that occur during a child's life that could be a separation from their parents. It could be witnessing violence in their home or in their community. It could be something around experiencing economic hardship and lack of um, stable housing or access to food. We've also expanded our understanding of the impact of trauma to also understand that racial and historical trauma can have an impact on children, as well as the systems in which they operate. One thing that has helped us all better understand trauma is experiencing the collective trauma of the pandemic, where we all from day to day experienced that dysregulation, that constant crisis mode, where you could feel within your bodies what it's like to have your stress levels go up and down and not be able to regulate. That is what many of our children experience when they are in their early years of developing, when they are experiencing trauma. The way that a trauma-informed community network makes a trauma-informed approach is instead of asking a child that's experiencing um, some kind of issue, not asking them what's wrong with you, but looking at what happened to you. What were those experiences that happened before you came into that classroom that day, into that uh, mental health service uh, provider's office, and better understanding what can, we, what can be done to address 
those experiences that happen to you and how can we ever prevent those from occurring? So our trauma-informed community, community networks from across the state, here there's six in Northern Virginia, um, have brought together folks who work with children and families in those various sectors, early childhood, mental health, foster care, um, schools, and tried to provide that same trauma-informed lens to their services across all of the networks. So here today in our conversation are the representatives of the Northern Virginia Trauma-Informed Community Networks who are working within their communities to apply those same approaches. Uh, today we have Alexandria and the RAISE Network, Arl the Arlington Resilience Community, the Fairfax Trauma-Informed Community Network, or TICN, the Loudoun Trauma-Informed Community Network, the Northern Shenandoah Valley Resilience Initiative, and the Greater Prince William Trauma-Informed Community Network. So we're gonna go in that order, alphabetical, to <laughs> introduce ourselves today. And I'm gonna ask, since we have a number of folks to, to go fairly quickly, I'm gonna ask each um, trauma network to, to quickly introduce yourself if you have two representatives, and then one, for one representative to give an example of your impact and the way that you have responded during the pandemic. Um, so we'll start with Alexandria. I think representing Alexandria Raise Network is Stacy Hardy Chandler. Uh, good morning. My name is Stacy Hardy Chandler, and I'm the director of the Center for Children and Families for the Department of Community and Human Services within the city of Alexandria. Um, I co chair Ray's Resilience Alexandria Informed Support Elevate with Chelsea Eichert, who's also on the call. Um, I'll certainly allow her to introduce herself. Um, we are taking this sort of co-chair approach to really building our community. Um, outside of RAISE in the Center for Children and Families, I oversee child welfare, a very diverse program, child welfare, early childhood, domestic violence, sexual assault, um, the, uh, youth development, which is prevention, uh, behavioral health services, so a whole array of uh, services that impact the community, which provides the backbone actually for our race community. Chelsea? Hi, uh, my name is Chelsea Eichert and I co-coordinate our city's trauma-informed community network with Stacy. And um, outside of RAISE, my role is to coordinate our city's children and youth community plan. Um, and one of the things that uh, RAISE did that made an impact was in response to the pandemic, we came together as a community to develop a citywide plan that promoted mental health and resiliency. And it had a number of strategies and initiatives in it, one being a um, COVID-19 wellness resource guide to promote mental health and resilience. Um, and then the other thing, uh, in addition to that, that made a big impact was a trauma and resiliency summit. Um, Stacey, do you wanna share a little bit about that summit? And I'll post some links in the chat. Yeah, coming out of that toolkit, um, we recognized that our community needed resources and an opportunity to share with one another. So we uh, conducted a summit May 20th. It had 15 workshops, three tracks, and 141 participants, which we were able to pull off with zero budget. <laughs> um, so, but it was a great opportunity to uh, springboard a lot of the activities we've done since then and the evolution of the plan. Um, rather than having it be a one day event, we really wanted it to be kind of a work session um, and it actually formed our agenda moving forward. So thank you everyone. And we really appreciate the support of other TICNs. Fantastic, Arlington. Good morning, my name is Shari Lyons. I'm our system of care manager here. So I live within our child and family services division of our Department of Human Services. So I, uh, I guess chair our trauma-informed community network, which we have renamed as our Arlington Resilience Community for a strength-based approach. Um, and apart from that part of what I do, I also oversee our CSA funded services. So Scott Reiner, uh, who is our state director would be part of the state executive council as well. Um, so there's some nice alignment in terms of shared values and vision and mission and uh, arc as well as uh, just overall how my uh, program is set up. And then Lynn, if you want to introduce yourself and you were actually 
uh, it was your team that did the PSA. So if you'd like to talk a little bit about those. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lin uh, Nghe. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am also a member, uh, along with Shari, with ARC. Uh, my primary um, uh, task with Arlington is to serve as the prevention director for the CSB. And uh, to highlight, um, it, it was hard to chisel down on, on what to highlight, uh, but to highlight uh, one or two events that we did, um, we did a couple of the uh, PSAs, public service announcements, uh, one at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this was done through Comcast Effect TV um, uh, program, and it was a 30 seconds, um, uh, very well done uh, PSA that gives a message that, you know, Arlington is strong, that we're here for you, and it really highlighted our services in Child and Family Services Division, including Behavior Health Bureau and the Child Welfare uh, Bureau. Um, so that was the first one back in March or April. And then more recently, um, we did a, a resiliency or ACE-oriented uh, PSA uh, that really highlighted the importance of, you know, going, given what we've all gone through, the importance of reconnecting and the role of uh, social connectedness in our resiliency. And uh, that was also very well received. And both of these PSAs for each of them, uh, the penetration rate uh, was about half a million uh, impressions for each. Um, so we've been really focusing on, on environmental impact with our community-wide uh, campaigns. And, and those were two of our successes. And I'll be happy to send that to the group for you to view. I know that we don't have time to do it today. But... Thank you, Thank Lynn you. and Shari. Uh, Fairfax, Jenna and Kelly. Morning, my name is Jenna White. I am part of the Fairfax County TICN, and I serve on that group representing the Fairfax County Council PTA. So I am a volunteer member of the TICN, and I know, Mrs. Northam, you're a huge friend of PTA. I remember our last big PTA, uh, Virginia PTA event was our, our conference a few years ago where you were our keynote speaker. So I really miss having our PTA family together, but happy to be uh, representing PTA here today. And I am um, involved in the ticket due to my own personal experiences. I learned that my son did have complex PTSD uh, when he was about eight after experiencing several ACEs um, in our home. So that led me on this journey. And um, I've been part of this TICN for about four years and then working closely uh, with, the, with the schools. The aspect I wanted to highlight for our Fairfax County TICN is our ACE interface presentation and our cohort. I was able to be part of the first cohort, which fortunately did launch before COVID. That was about 30 people. Um, so we were well positioned once COVID hit to switch to virtual and to continue to do those presentations. We just launched our second cohort. So we now have 60 presenters in Fairfax County doing ACE interface. And that does include in multiple languages. Uh, last spring, we did a Spanish presentation at my son's middle school uh, for families. And just this calendar year alone, we've done over 33 presentations um, with our cohort throughout the community. And what I really have, um, feel so strongly about is getting the ACE interface presentation to families. There's just tremendous thirst um, and desire to have this information and they are incredibly um, empowered and um, responsive once they have this information. So getting it out to parents, partnering with community groups, I think will continue to be tremendously valuable as we continue to deal with COVID. Hi, I'm Kelly Henderson. I joined Jenna on the Fairfax uh, TICN. Uh, I am the director of a Northern Virginia family-led nonprofit organization, Formed Families Forward. Uh, we're dedicated to supporting families that are formed through foster care, adoption, and kinship care, typically when an extended family member has stepped in to care for the child short-term or long-term. And all of those families are raising children with special needs. So we really do a lot of uh, work around the area of special education and community mental health. We provide free of charge consultations, uh, trainings. We have a couple videos I'll paste in the chat uh, that focus on trauma, 
understanding trauma, addressing trauma, and supporting trauma-informed schools, because those are issues so important to our foster, adoptive, and kinship families. Uh, as Jenna said, uh, Fairfax Ticken has done a lot of uh, really great work. We are also proud members and participants in four of the other Northern Virginia Tickens, because at Form Families Forward, we, we focus on the whole region, uh, foster, adoptive, and kinship families. So it's lovely to see uh, so many familiar faces and, and have connections throughout the region. Um, specifically to in the with the with the lens of Fairfax ticket and I wanted to share that uh, we've been fortunate to participate uh, in a number of their efforts to increase awareness uh, and skills in the area of trauma they have uh, deep uh, training experience in the areas of um, trauma-informed supervisor training which we participated in as well as trauma-informed spaces walkthroughs other examples are uh, uh, cost of caring trainings and other self-care trainings that are available throughout our community. Again, just ask and we are able to provide a team, often teamed with a family member or community member and an agency partner. So that's a wonderful model. Um, and we're really pleased to be representing, Jen and I are really pleased to be representing Fairfax as community members um, in, this, in this conversation. Uh, we have found that it's really, really critical that families with lived experience are co- a leading and collaboratively offering services and supports. Families must have the most accurate and up-to-date information on pandemic-related changes, um, especially as we think about our different, different and evolving formats for school and education and different ways to access medical and mental health services. Families really need to be partners and really um, kept up-to-date on the latest information so they can make informed decisions. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Fairfax representatives and Kelly for representing multiple entities there. I think it's great how we've already seen how trauma-informed community networks represent a variety of spectrums, schools, foster care, mental health, CSA, et cetera. Um, so we'll now we'll move on to hear from Loudon. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Emily. And uh, my name is Laurie Tisharsky. I'm the Director of Institutional Abuse Prevention at SCAN, and I facilitate uh, the Loudoun County um, tick-in. We have a colleague um, who will go after me who wears many hats, um, like uh, like others in our tick-in. And I, I just want to um, build on what the Secretary mentioned about um, you know, really operationalizing our knowledge about trauma-informed um, practices and the impacts of trauma. Um, so one of the things that we're quite proud of is that a TICIN member came forward from Loudoun County DFS and said there's a need for supervisors to understand how to conduct conversations with staff about returning to work um, and recognizing the sort of intersectional impacts um, that that um, on trauma and the and the pandemic. And we presented this um, sort of facilitated discussion framework um, to over a hundred supervisors for them to then take forward to their staff to have these conversations around secondary traumatic stress. Um, so I, I do appreciate that um, we want to move toward, you know, training and awareness, moving, moving that needle to planning and actually operationalizing um, our trauma-informed approaches within organizations. And I just want to call out Sam, who I um, who is here also from the Loudoun County Ticken. Thank you so much, Lori. It's my pleasure to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. I I love these conversations. They're so empowering and so important. So, um, like Lori said, my name is Samantha. Everybody calls me Sam. I welcome you to do the same. Um, so I am here in multiple capacities this morning. Um, my primary role, my kind of everyday job is that I am the Chief Operating Officer for Laws, Domestic Violence, and Sexual Assault Services here serving Loudoun County. So we are the comprehensive provider and designated provider for domestic violence and sexual assault services uh, for Loudoun County. And we also oversee and um, uh, provide the services to our Child Advocacy Center. So all of our um, forensic interviews for the county um, for uh, child abuse victims come through our uh, Loudoun Child Advocacy Center. Um, I think one of the things that we've really seen through the pandemic is the need to be consistently and effectively accessible, right? And I think we've seen an increase in isolation uh, through the pandemic, and especially that isolation has increased 
what we have seen and what we define as, as lethality, right, in, in this line of work, whether it's domestic violence or an increase in injuries when sexual assaults do occur. And so we've had to really redefine connection. I think it was Lynn who said, um, you know, making sure that we're reconnecting. But what does that, that connection look like for people who have been isolated? Right, and that's that's what happens when there's domestic violence, um, or people who want to harm other people. Um, that happens in isolation. So, how are we accessible, and how do we redefine connection uh, when abuse occurs in isolation, and people are being isolated by this pandemic? So, we have had to work intentionally with local, state, and regional partners to really think creatively about defining reconnection and ensuring access. So. The pandemic has forced us to be creative and redefine models of service. And um, so that's, I think, one of the things that uh, this has really, really taught us. Um, what we're also seeing is that isolation has increased trauma. People are coming to us um, really, really much more at risk and not only further at harm, but with increased need. So they're not only coming to us with trauma, but that trauma is compounded by vulnerability right? Um, they've lost more than they possibly would have prior to the pandemic. So it's the compounding effects of isolation and trauma. Um, so, so that's one hat that I wear. The other hat that I wear is I'm also the vice president of uh, Equality Loudoun, which is our advocacy organization for LGBTQ um, individuals in Loudoun County. And so um, one of the things that we're seeing is again, perpetuated by isolation, especially our youth um, who, who may be engaged in, in remote learning during the pandemic, what we're seeing is, is re-engaging in the school system has posed some challenges. Um, also, if uh, you're paying attention to Loudoun County right now, um, the issue around trans, uh, transgender identified youth or gender expansive youth has really become a hotbed issue. And what we're trying to do as Equality Loudon is call into the conversation a deeper understanding of the impact of um, a lack of understanding and a lack of inclusivity on these youth in terms of what that means from a trauma-informed lens. And that's why Equality Loudon has joined the TICM is because that conversation is critical in terms of understanding the depth and breadth of trauma on youth who are gender expansive or trans identified or LGBTQ, the rates of suicide, the rates of homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. And so we need to have a conversation that's broader and calls people into an understanding of the impact on these youth, not only in their homes, but in our schools and our greater community. So those are the two hats I wear um, and, and why it's critical that we're part of our um, trauma-informed care network here in Loudoun County. And I'll pass the baton, thank you. Thank you, Sam and Laurie. We're gonna head further west to the Northern Shenandoah Valley Resilience Initiative. And I think Shannon is on. Good morning. It's, it's such an honor to be on this uh, panel this morning. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Shannon Urum. I'm the Prevention and Wellness Services Coordinator at Northwestern Community Services Board and co-chair of Triumph Over Trauma, the Northern Shenandoah Valley Resiliency Initiative. And I think maybe we're the youngest uh, Ticken represented this morning. Um, and so uh, it's just, if, if we had had the, if you guys had had this meeting a month ago, we wouldn't have had a name. So we have had a name since in the last month. Um, and really for us, because we're a younger uh, network, it, it's really, first of all, if I had time to share just the amazing ways that the individual members of the network were able to pivot during this time, and continue to kind of address the needs in the community. It, it just is overwhelmingly uh, motivational to hear. It's nice to know that as long as you're in this, this position that things can throw curveball and we're still able to learn new tricks. We're not to, for some of us who've been here for, for a while, it's just great to see some of the innovative ways that, that the community has continued to reach out. But our, our, I wanna give a shout out to Rodney and Tina Colbreth who um, are the co-founders of the I'm Just Me movement who are really, uh, who are our backbone organization, really instrumental in saying, okay, there's a lot of great work being done locally in, in our communities. And we need to be in more intentional and in working together as it relates to trauma-informed care and uh, resiliency. And so during this last year, we've, we've 
really worked hard at formalizing our network. We had an opportunity to work with Arima Fobbs. I, I work with her through DBHDS and Collective Impact, I think is her organization that we worked through with her to um, do some strategic planning. Um, and so now we are working through these priorities such as governance, we have a mission, we have a vision statement, we're working on bylaws, because really we need to have and work on that foundational issue so that we can be very intentional with the strategies, programs, and, and practices that we're doing in the community as a group. And it's, it's really exciting to be part of the network. It's exciting to sit here and think that, and hear about the ways that we can get involved in our communities. And, 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 and I'm very grateful for the increased attention and funding at the state level that is supporting trauma-informed care networks and resiliency efforts. Um, and so thank you so much. Shannon, congratulations on your new initiative in Northern Shenandoah. Finally, rounding us out today is Prince William. I think Heather and Leah are on here. Good morning. Um, I'm Heather Martinson. I co-facilitate the uh, ticket of Greater Prince William with Leah Fraley from SCAN. Um, in my, my everyday role, I am the Behavioral Health and Wellness Supervisor with Prince William Community Services. Um, so part of the CSB network, um, and I'm just happy to be here. And so one of the ways, you know, as I was thinking about this the other day, one of the ways I think we uniquely uh, went around, went about promoting resiliency was focusing on food insecurity. Emily mentioned um, that earlier, um, and we collaborated with some of our food distribution sites, with some of our nonprofits, to get out into the community. We're people people as Tickens, um, and um, we were trying to figure out how we could still connect with people in our community, get our messages out, and also help our community. And so we um, collaborated with our food distribution sites. We went out every week, um, physically handed people boxes of food into and put it in their trunks of their cars. And with those boxes came messages, um, whether they were resilience messages from the network, individual resources from our member organizations. Um, and, you know, we first went out like we're going to help people. And going back to what Secretary Kerry said at the beginning, we realized getting out there and seeing each other outside of Zoom boxes and, you know, virtual meetings was also helping us reconnect with each other as network members but with our community members. And what we saw, you know, in those hours every week, um, what, you know, was just the connections we were making with individual community members, people we would see weekly due to their food insecurity. Um, and we were just asking how they were doing and what else they needed and being able to give them information about other resources in the community um, was one way we were able to help during this trying time. And while we were helping others, we realized we were helping ourselves as well as members. So um, we also connected with our school liaisons. Um, some of our more disadvantaged schools have school liaisons that connect with some of our um, more needy families. And so making a concerted effort to get them materials, get them supplies, get them food um, was another way that we, you know, as a network will be able be able to make that impact in the community. I'm gonna toss it over to Leah um, to introduce herself and, and share some more. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. I'm Leah Fraley. I'm the executive director of SCAN of Northern Virginia. We're a child abuse prevention nonprofit that works across the region. Um, the trauma network, I, Heather's already kind of talked about how we engaged in the community, but as we were doing that engagement, one of the things that we recognized is that we had to make sure that our house was strong too. The people who were in our tick and were struggling, um, we had a, a oftentimes had roundtable conversations and people were very vulnerable um, about how they were doing, how their mental health was doing. Um, and their inability to, to really help and find solutions for families was really getting to them. Um, and so we invested in making sure that we were a space, a safe space where they could come and get resources, um, talk through things. Um, we had kind of an open door computer um, policy so that if you needed support and there was something we could do, kind of regardless if it was our job or not, we'd be there for you because we needed our frontline strong. When we were out in the community, 
um, supporting um, schools and, and families. We also heard what they were saying about their inability to, to interact with resources because the tools that were being built were being built by people who understood how to access them. Um, and so people weren't always able to navigate a computer system to find services, et cetera. And so um, our tech in um, middle of, I think, November or so, uh, made a decision that we were going to uh, really uplift lived experience and understand how they need to access resources, how they communicate, how do we get things to them, not in the ways that we talk, but in the ways they do. Um, and so I think it's made us a stronger ticket, quite frankly. I think it's made us stronger just in general as a group, uh, but certainly we now know how to talk from a space of need versus a space of professionals, So, which I think is important. So thank you all. So wonderful to hear those examples from everyone today. And um, First Lady Northam, Secretary Kerry, please chime in if you have any other thoughts here from folks. Madam First Lady, why don't you go first as I, I've had the opportunity. Well, my goodness, so impressive. I mean, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part I have the work here today. As you know, and probably heard earlier that I'm the chair of the Children's Cabinet, uh, which is made up of the Secretary of Health and Human Resources, Secretary of Education, Secretary of Agriculture, and Secretary of Public Safety. You know, we wanted to bring together all those different silos that actually in government touch the lives of our children and see if we could bridge those gaps a little more effectively. So, you know, I, again, I'm so glad to be joined today by our incredibly talented advisor in childhood trauma and resiliency, T.D. Jenkins, who I'm sure you all met earlier, as well as the wonderful Secretary of Health and Human Resources, Dr. Dan Carey, who's been leading the way uh, in the way in which we talk about early education and trauma-informed care at Virginia state agencies. We're just so thrilled. We're fortunate to have them both serving in our administration with such a great wealth of experience from medical and education sectors. You know, our cabinet looked at what was the need amongst our pediatric population, our children in the community, and we focused on food security, early childhood education, maternal and infant health, student safety in schools and campuses, and of course, trauma-informed care. And we could not have done any of the transformative work that we've accomplished in these last few years in Virginia without you all, the advocates and the champions for children. You know, this little tour that we're trying to do with resiliency is an opportunity for our children's cabinet to really highlight you all, the many individuals, the communities, the agencies and organizations who came together to support our children, youth and families in so many ways that you just heard over the past three and a half years, especially during the pandemic. We are so grateful to you. I mean, wearing all the different hats you wear, historically underfunded, so many of these things that we're trying to do. So innovative to pivot every time a challenge was thrown at you. The governor and I are just so very grateful and we thank you on behalf of the Commonwealth. Your networks have been on the front lines, courageously and tirelessly working to meet the needs of our children, no matter what. Your trauma-informed community networks have been a critical part of that effort, and it shows that in our Commonwealth, children can thrive wherever they live, play, and learn. And you know, it really reminds me of one of my, my special friends, Mr. Rogers, who said, we live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, not my child, not my community, not my world, and not my problem. And then there are those who see the need and respond. And I consider those people, each and every one of you, my heroes. So I really appreciate you sharing with us today about the incredible work you've done to respond to the trauma and build resilience in your community, as well as what challenges you're continuing to face um, and how we can support you better at the state level. And as you know, um, we only have four years in Virginia. So as we transition to a new administration, uh, what we learn on this resilience tour from all of you, from all our friends will really help to inform the governor's outgoing legislative and budget priorities. And it will allow us to better prepare the leaders of the next children's cabinet on what they should be focusing their efforts on to, and what to continue doing for this essential work. So we really depend on your wonderful voices. Once again, the governor and I are so grateful to each and every one of you heroes. It's no small thing to make a huge difference in the trajectory of a life of a child. Because of you, we're closer to ensuring that every child has good food, adequate housing, medical care, excellent education, clean air and water, the laughter of a loving home, 
and supportive, thriving community. So I'm going to turn it back over to one of my personal favorite fearless champions, Emily Griffin, Griffey from Voices. So I'll hand it back to you, Emily. And thank you all again so very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Northam. And it's you guys have provided some amazing leadership for uh, the state agencies to conduct more trauma-informed approaches and for these communities to adopt more trauma-informed approaches. And you took some of the words right out of my mouth as an advocate to uh, think of the things that folks need to sustain this work and continue into the next administration. Uh, so with our last, I think we have about 15 minutes, I, I would love for folks to share some ideas on what they would like to see continue to help support this work. And we're really thinking of um, how we can support this work better for both the workforce that we've heard a lot about today, um, of managing that compassion fatigue, providing professional development resources, and continuing to, um, to meet the, the needs of uh, trauma-informed services, as well as specific populations that have been impacted by trauma. Northern Virginia is home to many immigrant families, now potentially more refugee families, uh, children of color, black and brown families, uh, so I'd love to hear any ideas from folks specifically to help meet the needs of specific populations as we move forward. So I'll toss it out. And if anyone's got their um, their million dollar or, or however much idea ready for the next administration, go ahead. Stacy. I think you started to raise your hand. Um, well, this is a, a little not specific. We know um, uh, there was disproportionality before the pandemic, and it was, you know, definitely uh, magnified by the, the pandemic. Um, what we saw because of what we had to do, and you heard the examples earlier, is we had to work across silos. We had to ignore some of the boundaries that we that were limiting us before. Uh, we had to collaborate in ways that we hadn't done before. And we had to actually mirror how families live. Families don't live in nice little categories like our organizations are structured. So I think if we need something moving forward, we need something that uh, really um, emphasizes or supports integrated services and working across systems and partnering with our community uh, members uh, we talked about lived experience and peer partners and those kinds of things. I know that there's some legislation around that happening, um, but efforts that support that that working across those boundaries doesn't happen by luck. It has to be done strategically. But again, it mirrors how our families actually live. So that's a blessing of the pandemic that it forced us to work together and play together in the sandbox, so to speak, in order to support every member of our community. Um, but I think we also need an investment in a flexible and nimble way of operating moving forward. Thank you, Stacey. I hear things like continuing the children's cabinet as a part of that and ensuring that funding can be used across the state agencies and silos and bringing lived experiences to the tables like the children's cabinet as well to help um, influence those decisions. Anyone else want to throw out their idea? Kelly, go ahead. Thanks. I just wanted to, to um, reinforce a little bit of what Stacey was saying about the importance of collaborating across our, our silos. Um, and, and I want to speak just a moment about kid, children with disabilities. Um, those, those children and youth are extra impacted, have been extra impacted by the, the pandemic. The needs for structure and predictability are not only core trauma-informed principles, but are really key practices when we're working with students who receive special education. Um, services and supports and staffing issues are contributing to challenges and providing that uh, need, meeting that need for structure and predictability. Um, so we really need to address, I think, some of those, those staffing issues across our silos um, as we think about our kiddos with the highest level of needs. Um, children and youth with disabilities are also extra vulnerable and many times medically. So uh, returning to the school building has not always been, while ideal, may not always be possible for all of our, all of our children. Um, and so as we think about helping families identify coping strategies to support their use with their children, uh, we know that it may involve basic understanding of brain science, 
but also are allowing the space and time and the resources to do the important trauma supported work. Um, and so returning to the, the before normal times, before the pandemic times may not be our best, our best response. Uh, we've learned some things during this pandemic time, as Stacy eloquently said, we knew there were challenges before uh, the pandemic. And so as we build back, I think we really need to think strategically about giving children, families, and the, the services that support, the service systems that support those families, uh, opportunity to do things differently that really focuses on um, best practices and giving the time and space and the, and the funding um, to give um, uh, space for those, those skills to be developed and reinforced and make those valued um, <laughs> valued activities. Uh, so jumping back into the textbooks may not be the, the thing that everyone needs at the moment, but giving, giving opportunities for families and kids to, to do what they need to do to be able to return to those textbooks at some point is really important. Focusing on the social emotional well-being, right, of kids. It's the whole, whole wellness approach. Oh, I can't tell who was first, Sam or Shuri. I'm going to go with Sam. Thank you so much. Let me put my hand down. I always the etiquette of these things, right? Um, so one of the things that I will add to that is I think just, um, you know, for us at the peak of the pandemic after the stay, uh, stay at home order was uh, rescinded is our shelter capacity was over 300% of our normal, right? And so, you know, and as a general rule, over 50% of our uh, individuals in shelter um, are children. So the exposure to violence and the exposure to trauma is very, very high. And what we're also seeing, so as you kind of uh, build the statistics there, you know, we're seeing the incidences of violence go up. The impact on children is very high, right? But then what we're also seeing across Loudoun County in particular, because our, um, our uh, uh, community is growing exponentially, and, and within that growth, the diversity is growing exponentially as well. Uh, what our community looks like is changing. And so what we're also seeing is the, the increased demand when, when, uh, you know, when we talk about the diversity of the community is we have to be able to respond to the unique needs of those individuals. So that's, that's talking about um, language access and, and, the act, and, and the ability to meet those needs of those individuals who've experienced trauma in a culturally responsive and culturally human, uh, cultural, a way of cultural humility, humility, right? And so I bring all that up to say that what we are struggling with as a provider in Loudoun County to meet the needs of those who've experienced trauma, especially children, are skills staff with language skills. What we, what we can't seem to do is hire a therapist who speaks a, 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 a native language, right? And so we're not able to meet the needs of, of, of individuals who've experienced gender-based violence or children who've experienced that violence or witnessed that violence, both in our CAC and in our um, primary domestic violence and sexual violence services. So what we're seeing is core needs in our community go unmet to address trauma. And so when we also try to refer out, the wait lists are exponential, especially to meet the needs of traumatized children who, who have that expertise, right? And when we talk about that being a critical need, I would say that that's one of them. And I, I, I think to prioritize that, it's looking at, we always talk about funding, we talk about training, talk about those kind of things, but if we're gonna prioritize what it means to address trauma from a skill-based, um, culturally aware way, it's recognizing the value that comes in having those skills. It's bringing in a workforce that understands and is trained in trauma and can address that from a, a culturally informed um, way. And that's not easy if we don't have the resources as as nonprofits and, and government organizations to, to bring in that workforce uh, to our community. So I think that that's one thing that we're definitely seeing. We've had vacant positions now for well over six months and that those needs have just gone unmet um, and our community is traumatized. And so I would definitely, definitely bring that up. Um, thank you. Sam, a lot of encouragement for bringing that point up from others on this list. We've heard the same throughout the state of long waiting lists for services. You know, uh, positions unfilled and your point here is as we move forward, there's been a lot of attention from the legislature and the administration on how to meet mental health needs and your point, 
on ensuring that children have culturally appropriate, ling linguistically appropriate, and specialized uh, workforce is going to be so critical as we try to address those needs as well. So thank yeah. you for saying that. Sure. Thank Jerry. you. Mary. And, and sorry, this is Dr. Carrie, if I could just respond, I, I could not agree more. It, it's not only the quantity of, of the workforce, it's the special training and, and contemporary training that they need as well. And um, we, in fact, we have a meeting later in the week with our community college system to talk just about that, uh, but the behavioral health uh, and general health workforce and, and how they might contribute. There's no question that it's both quality and quantity, you've got to have both. And, and we've seen that not just in our state hospitals with community-based providers like yourselves and, and, and sister organizations, uh, there, there is uh, no more important issue uh, yeah. in, in behavioral health and, and trauma-informed services in Virginia. And I think calling a impassioned workforce into doing trauma work is hard enough. And then also calling a skilled workforce into that, I think is, is can be challenging as well because doing trauma every day takes passion and 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 we need skill. Yeah. So th thank you, Secretary Kerry. Thank you both. And I think Sherry, you've had your hand up for a while. So I'll have you be our last comment here. And then we're going to turn things over because I know Ms. Northam has to get onto more examples in Loudoun County as well. So Sherry, your last idea for, for the next administration. The only thing, thank you, Emily. The only thing I would um, add is some targeted professional development around equity. So I know Senator Kerry, you talked about that a little bit initially. You used the word like equity, right? And when we've been um, developing and thinking about what we should be doing for our trauma-informed community network, we've been noticing that uh, shared language and shared understanding is not the same depending, you know, who you have at the table. So being able to normalize some of those conversations, even around centering race and the history of race in the US and what those spaces look like. Um, so that would just be a suggestion, right? Because when we talk about being trauma informed and being able to have individuals at our table, uh, we should be comfortable saying Shari Lyons is white and the person next to us could be black, right? And that's an appropriate um, part of our conversation and being able to uh, see individuals in the fullness of themselves and who, who they are includes their race, ethnicity, gender identities, all those different spaces. So I would love to see some a specific targeted uh, resources education around equity and what that looks like in practice. Thank you, Shari. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to TD and Ms. Northam or Secretary Kerry for any final thoughts today. Sure, maybe, maybe I'll go first. I uh, will give. Oh, no, yeah, Ch Chidi, go ahead. No, I was gonna leave it to you and the first lady. I get to talk with these folks all the time. So please take the Well, maybe I'll go first and leave the last word to the first lady. Um, couldn't agree more, I think, um, with Sherry's last uh, comment. And, and I, I, one of the things that we have through the Department of Paper Health's proposed budget, we're, we're, we're waiting to see what the, the forecast is and, and what the, the, we know what the governor's priorities are, but how it's gonna translate in terms of available general fund uh, going forward in his introduced budget. But there's the Center, Center for Evidence-Based Practice proposal. The agencies, DSS, Behavioral Health, CSA, um, DMAS, uh, and VDH and others, Department of Juvenile Justice, working together with academic centers, a proposal to really bring best practices with regard to trauma-informed care, equity in action, in policies, procedures, operations, uh, appropriate research, uh, appropriate outcomes uh, efforts uh, around these very real world issues that have been neglected for far too long. So I'm very optimistic that that is on not just on our radar, but we proposed uh, at least within HHR. And, and my hope is that that will make it through just depending on, on what our, our, our total amount of new general fund is available. But I do think that it's got to be real. I and mean, we've got to step up in every way to whether it's institutional racism or um, uh, a number of issues also with trauma-informed care because they're, there's, it's a Venn diagram. They're not, obviously, they're, they're not the same, but there is overlap that we need to make sure that we, 
we take into account and operationalize. So the, thanks so much for this opportunity to listen and thank you all for your great work. I just will add briefly, thank you, Dr. Carey, and thank you all so very much again for sharing your great wisdom and learned truth. And you know, again, we wanna emphasize, we can put all this out there, we can put it all in a nice package with a bow, but really um, to help push it forward, it's gonna be you all and your voices and your experience to say, to tell your stories and to tell your truth. Of course, everyone cares about the incredible work that you do, but we need you to help us. Um, we'll put it in there and then we'll need you to help us drive it home. And I know you're just the people to do that because you've done such incredible work and we've come so far um, and we wanna to continue to do everything we can for the children here in Virginia. So thank you all so very I know I think so. through this last year and they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay, mostly because of you all. So thank you so very much and hang in there. We'll get through this. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Thank you all. And thank you for making this a focus of your last uh, months and a part of your legacy with the Northam administration as well. Thank you for hosting thank these you. conversations and we hope for more to come. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Emily, for host, uh, moderating and to the Alexandria Chicken for hosting. We hope to see you all on the road. And certainly, I'll just wrap up by saying if y'all want to send any messages that you couldn't get shared today, please do feel free to reach out um, either to Emily or myself um, or any of the folks. I think y'all know how to find us pretty easily. So thanks. And please join us for our other community, com uh, community conversations throughout the month of October. Here. Thank you so much.